So Fadion, you can, yes, recording is started. Uh, so today our speaker, uh, we have our speaker, Professor Davide Grossi, who is um, so a professor at the Bernoulli Institute of Mathematics, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence at the University of Groningen, and also a so a professor at the Amsterdam Center of Law and Economics and the Institute for Logic, Linguistic and Computation at the University of Amsterdam. He's an expert of AI. And today uh, we'll present on a very exciting topic, uh, algorithmic governance in blockchain protocols applic with applications to collective decision-making. Davide, we're very happy to have you here and please, you have the floor. And uh, if anyone uh, has questions, uh, we usually wait until the presenter has finished with, for, for, for big discussion. But if you have clarifying question, you can put it in the chat. Uh, we'll make sure that, that David get to David. David, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Alessia. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to uh, um, uh, be here today, albeit virtually, and, uh, and um, uh, contribute to your seminar series at uh, ACLE. So um, what I'm going to talk to, about today is uh, algorithmic governance in blockchain. I will do it uh, in a uh, so non, uh, fairly non-technical way. Uh, I will try to go especially first through, uh, say, uh, set the ground by explaining a bit what I'm, um, uh, what we understand under blockchain protocols and the kind of a governance issue that play a role there. And towards the end of the talk, I will um, uh, report on current work I'm doing with uh, a few co-authors specifically on the topic of hard forks. Like, like Alessio said, uh, I'm very happy to uh, take, uh, you know, quick questions during, the, uh, during my presentation. Uh, I will keep an eye myself on the chat. So feel free to drop also a question in the chat and I'll try to react to them. If I don't, uh, Fation uh, is uh, also uh, keeping an eye on the, on the chat and will flag any questions to me that I can uh, pick up on the fly. So by all means, I'm happy to uh, have an interactive session. And otherwise, of course, uh, uh, I look forward to the Q&A uh, at the end. So before I, um, before I start with the topic, I wanted also, I did also just quick, uh, uh, one quick slide about, uh, say, myself, in particular, my research interest uh, as, uh, uh, as a researcher. So I'm interested generally in uh, all sorts of questions have to do with uh, collective decision making. Uh, so generally, how can groups or collectives take good decision together? So this uh, I'm interested in applications. So in the ramifications of this question in several areas, from say voting, uh, digital democracy, say uh, deliberation, online deliberation, uh, blockchain protocols. Uh, so shifting from say group decision making among humans to group decision-making among uh, algorithms or machines, uh, and as well as uh, uh, swarms. So decision-making in, in uh, say large groups of fairly simple, uh, uh, from a cognitive point of view, uh, computational entities. So this is a bit about um, myself, and this gives you also the uh, kind of view, uh, an, an, an idea of the angle from which I'm approaching, for instance, questions. In, within uh, the blockchain uh, context. Okay, so let me start with then the first part of the talk. So what is, uh, what is blockchain? Where did it come from? Okay, so I take um, say a long view on this because uh, blockchain is actually a technology uh, for uh, coordination uh, convention. Here I have a quote from uh, David Hume, uh, Scottish philosopher from the 18th uh, century, where uh, in this quote, you see a convention is a sense of interest supposed to be common to all and where every single act is performed in expectation that others are to perform the like. Without such convention, no one would ever have been induced to conform his actions to it. So blockchain is actually a technology that allows us to align our expectations and sustain cooperation and convention in a digital open setting. So this kind of uh, um, uh, 
like gives you the background of the way I, in which I understood and I study uh, blockchain as a coordination technology. So more specifically, then what is uh, blockchain? So when we refer to a blockchain system, we're actually talking about two uh, elements. One, the blockchain proper, and second, the so-called consensus protocol. So the, when we refer to more uh, specifically to the blockchain proper, we are actually talking about essentially what is called the data structure. And in the blockchain setting, this data structure is a chain of blocks, quite literally. And uh, these blocks have, of course, some inherent uh, properties, of, uh, some internal characteristics. Uh, in particular, uh, every block uh, in, in the blockchain has uh, an identifier, a so-called hash, to the previous block. So that every block somehow uh, contains all the information about the uh, preceding history of, of the chain. So all the previous blocks that have occurred in the chain. It contains that. So in, in this way, it makes it for an immutable or hard to temper record. So every block has an in, a index or kind of uh, is pointing to uh, in, in, uh, in unequivocal manner to the previous block and contains of course new information. In a Bitcoin blockchain, this new information would be, for instance, transactions, okay? Information about the transactions that have occurred on the platform. And then it contains uh, another technical uh, element that's called the nonce, which is essentially uh, a proof that the, that the block has been uh, constructed uh, by uh, the person that actually had the right to do it. So that's the data structure. So that's, uh, if you wish, um, uh, the way we, the way the uh, blockchain represents a ledger, in the case of a cryptocurrency application, so uh, takes rec takes a record of the exchanges of the currency, and then there is a consensus protocol. So this consensus protocol arguably is really the uh, key innovation uh, in in blockchain blockchain technology, in particular in you know, the key innovation that was put forward by Bitcoin when it was first proposed in 2008. So what this consensus protocol does uh, is essentially takes care of um, resolving effectively a governance problem. Uh, the governance problem had to do with record keeping of the transaction and it does that and resolves that governance problem algorithmically, so through an algorithm. So when we are building a blockchain, then the natural question is, what is the block that come ne comes next? And determining the blocks that comes next is precisely the uh, aim of the consensus protocol. So you can think of a blockchain, uh, in, in, for instance, in the Bitcoin context, as essentially uh, yeah, a ledger plus a, a, a sort of um, algorithmic solution to our algorithmic replacement for the sort of institutions that would take care of record keeping on, on an official ledger. So now in the uh, coming um, slides, I will uh, focus on the uh, uh, concept of consensus protocol and give an idea of how, those pro of how the consensus protocol in particular uh, in the uh, Bitcoin blockchain, so it's so-called proof of work consensus protocol actually work and resolves uh, this, um, this issue about the selection of the next block. In doing so, I want to um, uh, also kind of show the genesis of the idea and why it has been, it's become important. So in particular, I want to uh, kind of convey the problem that a cons the consensus protocol in a blockchain system actually uh, um, uh, uh, takes care of resolving. So if we look kind of, uh, again, we take a, a long uh, perspective, the, the problem that a, a, blockchain, a blockchain system resolves, in particular, uh, as I said, I, I zoom in and say the Bitcoin uh, perspective, because that's the kind of the one we are most acquainted with. But what I'm going to say uh, actually applies to a number of uh, alternative uh, blockchains. So they all 
actually have to uh, take care of what is called, uh, what has been called in computer science, this, the Byzantine generals problem. Okay, so that's a fundamental problem in distributed computing. And uh, uh, it, is, it can be explained fairly uh, easily through this metaphor of, of the generals and the Byzantine generals. So how does that uh, go? So suppose that we have uh, three generals. Suppose there is a main general, uh, the one at the top and two lieutenant generals, and they have to coordinate an attack on a castle. And of course there is a twist, like if they attack together, uh, they win. If they don't attack together, those that attack will be defeated. So they really have to work together and coordinate uh, their actions. Now, the problem is that some of these generals actually uh, may be traitors, so they, uh, they cannot all be trusted. Uh, and of course, we don't know, uh, so the generals in the picture, they don't know who the traitor is. Now, suppose that we're in a situation like this, there is a top general, a high general uh, sends a message uh, to the other general saying uh, we should attack. Okay, but now the blue puppet here stands for a, a Byzantine or a traitor general. And this traitor general sends a message to the other lieutenant saying, uh, well, our boss, so the high, uh, uh, high up general said we should retreat. Now, the bottom right general now has conflicting information coming in. So essentially, uh, it cannot know uh, what to do. Uh, the doubt that he's got is who's, well, I'm getting conflicting information. So somebody must be Byzantine, but I don't know who's uh, actually trying to fool me, whether the blue one or the, uh, or the uh, high up general. So this is, uh, a very simple uh, kind of toy problem that plays uh, played an important role in the development of distributed computing. So, and in particular, if you th uh, think of the uh, the the problem of replicating a ledger in several locations, uh, you can think of this uh, general uh, of this uh, general setting, where um, uh, as essentially uh, individuals that have to coordinate their record keeping and they know that some, somebody may not be trusted and they have to kind of uh, find a way in which they can, uh, uh, they can coordinate their ledgers so that those ledgers contain the same information. So in, the, in this distributed computing tradition, what uh, one needs to look for is solution, uh, algorithmically solution that kind of satisfy this desideratum. That if the general high up is loyal, then every loyal lieutenant have to react in the same way. So they have to obey the same order. And that's kind of um, uh, the way in which you can circumvent or hope to circumvent the presence of Byzantines or faulty malicious, act malicious actors in the group. And uh, there is plenty of results about this uh, setting, of course, the whole tradition that also left, uh, you know, uh, generated se several uh, so-called Turing Awards, so the, uh, the equivalent of Nobel Prizes uh, in uh, the computing sciences. And we know that this problem is solvable if there are enough, say, loyal generals, so three times more than the Byzantine. And then one can come up under, those, uh, under that restriction with algorithms that can resolve the Byzantine generals problem. However, uh, these solutions always uh, make an assumption that there is uh, essentially two assumptions that the communication happens synchronously. So they can all communicate without delays and that essentially the system is closed. So that we can have uh, a good control about uh, the upper bound of malicious agents in the system. In general, the problem is not solvable. Uh, and that was the context. Uh, and uh, so that was proven mathematically in the 80s. And uh, that's the sort of uh, hurdle that blockchain technology managed somehow to circumvent. Okay, so that's kind of gives you an idea why of also the technical uh, ideas that underpinned the development of uh, blockchain technology. 
and why the advent of Bitcoin uh, made such a uh, such a, a splash, including in the uh, distributing computing uh, context. So, how did uh, uh, Bitcoin's blockchain go around this limitation? Uh, the idea was that um, essentially one could still uh, reach, resolve the uh, essentially the Byzantine general problem in a randomized way, and even in the presence of an open system, namely a system where you cannot uh, trust, uh, you cannot actually impose any level of control on who's joining uh, the system or not. So in this slide, I just want to give you a glimpse of how uh, of the so-called of how the so-called Nakamoto consensus protocols work, just by using intuitive, uh, simple ideas. And that was really kind of the breakthrough that uh, blockchain uh, uh, brought about. So we have our chain up until a certain level. These are the blocks, the records, all all past transactions. Now we want to uh, uh, well, we want to add a new a new block. Uh, that contains the new transaction that have taken place. So we have to query, say, the network. These are these are the network of users of the protocol, and they have to decide which block should we add. And uh, they have to do it under uncertainty because essentially they don't know who is in the network. They don't know uh, whether there are Byzantine malicious agents, how many, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they have to coordinate to take a decision in a way that will guarantee their records to be uh, coordinated. So the way this protocol works, the Nakamoto consensus protocol is as follows. You have this network, essentially you ask nodes or individuals in the network to come up with proposals for the next block. So suppose these three individuals come up with proposals. One wants to add this blue block, then a green block, a, blue, a black block. This proposals, then participate in a sort of lottery. Uh, this lottery is a bit special because the chances of winning the lottery, so the chances of deciding which is which one is the next block, uh, equal actually the share of, your, of the total effort you put in the system. Uh, in Bitcoin, the effort essentially means computational power, so your investment in, in supporting the network. So you run this kind of lottery, which essentially works as follows. Somebody, so the ones that would like to uh, participate, they have to guess a number. And uh, it could happen that to some part of the network now believing that the next block is the black one and some other part of the network believing that the next block is actually the green one. And this is what is called a fork or a soft fork. So it's something that just because of the, uh, of the way the network is structured and the way the protocol works, you have some tempora uh, temporary divergence in the chain. Now then the last step in the, in the algorithm is, is essentially something that tries to resolve uh, automatically uh, these uh, these this sort of forks. And remember, if uh, I should say, if you a key aspect of the of the protocol is that if your block is selected, uh, then you will get a reward, right? So if you win the lot, if you can show that you won the lottery because you guessed the right number, then you will get bitcoins for that. And those bitcoins reward are recorded in the block that you uh, proposed. Okay, but we, we are in a situation where several blocks may be proposed uh, in different parts of the network. So what happens there next is essentially voting. So the different nodes in the networks, the different individuals decide, have to decide upon, uh, so which, which of the available blocks to, um, to uphold. And they do it in Bitcoin by one rule. Essentially, they, they vote, they should vote if they are honest, they should vote on on the, uh, um, on the part of the chain that is longer. Okay, so that, that has accrued more, uh, um, um, more records and therefore has accrued more investment in computational power. 
So at the end, uh, with a high probability, only one block will be selected and replicated across the network. So this is a scheme that essentially uses two, uh, two ideas. There is a kind of um, this distributed form of lottery plus a form of, uh, of voting to resolve uh, uh, temporary forks. And that's how the uh, uh, Bitcoin protocol actually resolves uh, the Byzantine general problem in a situation where nobody has any idea who's actually within the network. And therefore nobody has any idea who, who uh, should be trusted or not. So this gives uh, this a kind of yeah, algorithmic solution to a governance problem, namely how to uh, maintain a ledger over time in a situation where you have no control of who's, uh, who's actually taking part in the system. So an important idea in this protocol is that, uh, uh, oh, let me see, I see a, a question. So before I go to this slide uh, by Constantina, do users understand, choose which proposed block they are investing computational power to? Uh, yes, they do choose on uh, uh, the block they, uh, they would like to mine on. Uh, so that's uh, but the so the protocol rule is you should block you should mine on the longest uh, say on the longest chain. Now in the, my previous sketch, uh, um, I kind of glanced over one detail that I want to zoom in into this um, onto this slide, and I hope that this will give you a little bit uh, more information about uh, precisely your question, because essentially what Constantina asks is. Okay, now we have uh, different branches in the in the um, in the chain. I want to add a new block. I should choose uh, which which block uh, which branch to choose to add my block onto. Okay, so that's the that's the decision problem that uh, miners say are uh, have to resolve. And so let me just. Uh, uh, continue on this slide because that will lead to an answer uh, also to, the, to this question. So the short answer is yes, they choose and they should choose uh, by uh, investing on, by selecting the longest uh, available chain. So why, do the, do we, why does the protocol work like that? Uh, because essentially one of the main um, uh, requirements that, uh, that was imposed Kind of in the white paper for Bitcoin was to avoid the so-called um, double spending attack. So double spending essentially relies on the possibility to fork the to fork the blockchain. Uh, what does that mean? So that we suppose that we have a possible continuation of the chain where, for instance, Alice transfers some funds to Bob, and of course gets maybe a good in uh, in, in exchange for that. Then Alice may be then kind of tempted to leave that chain and create a new chain. Uh, so kind of backtrack and fork the, the chain so that into a new history where those funds have never been spended. So where she actually is keeping those funds. And what the, well, the scheme of the protocol kind of um, makes it hard to uh, carry out uh, um, uh, uh, kind of an operation of this type for a very simple, uh, under kind of a very simple assumption. So under the assumption, and this is the only formula I have, uh, only only equation I have in my in my slides. If you take this p to be the probability that a honest uh, node uh, mines the next block, so a honest individual in the ne network mines the next block, then one minus p is the probability that a dishonest uh, uh, individual minds the next block. So at every point in time, the probability of a dishonest uh, node mining the next block is one minus P over P. Now the characteristic of the protocol is that if we iterate this, so uh, we take N to be the number of blocks, the probability of, uh, of a dishonest miner to mine say N blocks goes down very quickly okay so that makes that means that uh, a, a dishonest chain will always have well uh, will always be possible but very very improbable 
and that's just because the honest uh, the honest nodes will try to mine on the uh, on the longest on the longest chain so an attacker would always have to kind of catch up with uh, with uh, a longer chain that has been constructed by honest ones okay so this was um, a bit of the background on the on the uh, key proof of work or nakamoto consensus protocol and it's well you see it's fairly complicated scheme to try to resolve uh, uh, the, the the maintenance of a ledger on a distributed what is the difference between a hard and a soft fork i already mentioned the notion of soft fork in the previous slides so a soft fork is a temporary divergence of the chain so this can be due to signal delays or as in network latency. So just the fact that uh, at different parts of the network, um, different nodes may be resolving, may be winning that lottery at the same time. So these minor or temporary divergences of the chain are resolved by the, uh, by the protocol itself. A hard uh, fork instead is a permanent divergence as typically it's what is due to a software upgrade. A software upgrade that is, say, not backward compatible. The idea is this. If you think of uh, this chain as being um, you know, constructed through a software, uh, as, as if at, certain, at certain point I decide to upgrade that software and I make that software not backward compatible, that means that the new blocks constructed by the new software, the updated software, will not be readable uh, or usable for, uh, for uh, the user to actually use the older software. And that's what generates a hard chain. And this is typically what uh, requires still uh, off-chain, so-called off-chain governance. So you need structures uh, that, are, that are not algorithmic and that have to take care of these situations. So a good example is, for instance, in 2017, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain has been hard forked into in creating effectively a new cryptocurrency that was called then a Bitcoin Cash. So Bitcoin, the people behind the, the community of developers and users behind Bitcoin Cash were un, uh, essentially unhappy with the fact that uh, Bitcoin was still maintained, especially as a store of value rather than a, a real transactional currency. And therefore, uh, kind of uh, agreed to carry out a software update that uh, that was was not backward compatible, and that created uh, effectively a new chain. So the a new blockchain maintained under the name of Bitcoin Cash, using a different algorithm uh, to uh, create uh, the chain. And maybe it's interesting to know that what we know uh, what we know as Bitcoin has actually undergone. Uh, at least, if I'm not wrong, seven hard forks in the course of its history. So hard forks are somehow are a way for uh, little communities of cryptocurrencies to, uh, to kind of uh, to sp to create spin-offs uh, uh, and, and give rise to uh, essentially new, um, new applications using different blockchains. So hard forks, as I said, like our permanent divergences and they're due to software upgrades. This sometimes may even be um, kind of uh, uh, caused by bugs in the software. Okay, so this is a nice story that, uh, that uh, happened in 2013, again, about the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. Uh, at that point, uh, there, there was a new software update being uh, pushed on the network uh, the 0 0.8 software uh, upgrade, but it has the problem that was not uh, backward compatible. And the, kind of they realized this uh, uh, suddenly. And here I have a kind of a, a nice uh, uh, log of a, uh, of a chat in which, well, the main developers together with the main miners in the blockchain network kind of decided what to do. Uh, and this is uh, come from a uh, very interesting analysis by uh, um, Narayan. Uh, on a uh, kind of blog post 
saying, okay, and analyzing the 2013 Bitcoin fork, centralized decision-making saved the day. So what happened, like at a certain point, one uh, developer realized, okay, we're actually accidentally hard forking. Uh, so, uh, and there, the, a kind of disagreement uh, takes place. One, one developer says, well, now we push this upgrade in the network, actually the, the chain that was generated through this upgrade is longer. So we should keep mining on that one, even though, uh, even though that, is, that, that chain will not be compatible uh, with, uh, with the earlier version. So we'll effectively fork the Bitcoin chain. Another developer says, well, I don't agree with this because this indeed would be an accidental hard fork without any purpose. And what happens uh, here in this, in, this, uh, in this log is that then a big mining pool, BTC Guild, decides then, uh, okay, no, no problem. I can, by, my just, uh, just my, by putting all my computational power at disposal to effectively uh, backtrack and make sure that the that part of the chain that was generated by the older software gets the majority uh, support and gets then the longer uh, managing in a sense shows a very fluid um, unstructured form of uh, uh, of governance at the, uh, you know, sitting at the top of these algorithmic systems. So this kind of leads me into the uh, last part of my talk where I want to uh, actually uh, look at hard forks and, uh, uh, and try to kind of understand how these could be uh, actually governed as well in an algorithmic manner. So, this has to do with uh, the so-called, um, well, line of research that looks at ways in which governance issues in blockchain system could at least in part be moved and become part of the uh, protocol itself so that they don't have to rely anymore on uh, say external and perhaps not so transparent uh, uh, institutions or just groups of uh, informal groups of developers and miners taking decision on uh, the cryptocurrencies. So this is um, what I'm going to present is, is part of ongoing work uh, with a series of collaborators, Ben Abramovich from Rensselaer in the uh, Polytechnic in the US, Edith Elkin, University of Oxford, Woody Shapiro from Weizmann Institute of Science, Israel, and Nimrod Talmon from uh, Ben Gurion University, uh, also in Israel. So as I said, this kind of tries to contribute to um, uh, the you know a pathway towards the incorporation of more uh, elements of on-chain governance in uh, in uh, blockchain protocols. Okay, so what uh, I will st uh, want to start with is uh, let me finish here the simulation the um, animations. I want to look at this forking or hard forking uh, governance as a problem. Uh, of so-called social choice. So social choice is a branch of uh, economic theory, in particular welfare economics, that concerns itself with um, uh, collective decision-making in situation that can vary from uh, voting or fair division, matching problems. So it's an established area of research in economics. And uh, in the recent years has taken, uh, has been uh, taking up more and more also by uh, AI researchers and computer scientists, looking at kind of the interface between it and uh, computational issues. So how can we look at the forking problem as a social choice problem? So uh, as follows, so we have N individuals, those are the nodes in the networks, the participants, the miners, and there are two alternatives, the two, the two kind of uh, branches of a, of a fork, A and B. Now there are two outcomes uh, possible from, from a fork in a, uh, in a situation like this. Essentially, it's uh, as the assignment of participants, individuals to the two different alternatives. Who is following the branch A and who's following the branch B? 
that's what you would uh, see here at the bottom right of the uh, of the um, of my slides. An assignment is essentially well; those are uh, orange arrows from agents or participants to alternatives. So that's the outcome of a fork that basically decides who's joining which part of the chain. Then the question is, how can we fairly determine an outcome, so such an assignment, based on individual preferences? What is a preference here? Uh, in the red box, you see an example of a preference for two agents. What, you, what, what I mean there is, uh, when I write, for instance, A2, means that um, uh, the, uh, the outcome where I'm assigned to alternative A with, uh, uh, with two agents in total is something I prefer to being assigned to alternative B with two agents in total, which in turn is something I prefer to an assignment where I'm assigned to A alone, which in turns I prefer to being assigned to B alone. So those kind of uh, pairs tell me, okay, what I prefer and how many people I'd like to be there with me. And that's something that you can um, expect individuals facing a forking situation to have. Okay, those are the preferences. So, and determining fairly an outcome uh, basically means this: I can, at a high level of abstraction, I can ask all all uh, agents to have a, to have their preferences, and I should resolve those preferences by constructive constructing an assignment that makes them happy, okay? This assignment may involve a fork or not. So it may be such that every, everyone is assigned to the same alternative. So there is no forking happening, or it can be that a fork happens because some part of these N individuals are assigned to A and some parts are assigned to B. So this is what we call an assignment rule. So the question is, are there assignment rules that resolve this forking problem? And while looking for these assignment rules, we have to ask ourselves like, what, uh, what are desirable behaviors that we would like to have from these rules? So these rules I said should behave fairly. So fair, fairly uh, has to be made precise. Okay, and we do that essentially in one way. These assignments that we produce through an assignment rule should be say, should be so-called stable. So I should produce assignments that actually no one would like to change. Okay, so the rule should produce an outcome uh, where no one would actually like to be assigned to the alter to the al other alternative is not being assigned to. So that's a notion of stability. Nobody would like to change that outcome. And that's what we call, uh, well, what well, we take this as a proxy for fairness. This rule should also have computational properties. This, and in that term, we refer to them as tractable. So they should be easy to compute. They should, they should be algorithms that we can run efficiently. And finally, a last desideratum is that these rules should be uh, so-called strategy proof. So it should be difficult to uh, manipulate them by misrepresenting your preferences. Okay, so when I say that an assignment rule then is strategy proof, I mean that the rule in for the rule, so there is no one that can benefit to get, so to can get a better outcome for themselves by actually lying to the rule and telling the rule a different preference from the one it actually has. So these are kind of, um, key notion that actually come from economic theory and particular mechanism design and social choice. So now I just shift to the key results uh, in the paper uh, quickly. The paper uh, that I also uh, um, uh, circulated, of course, it was a technical paper that looked at specific, uh, well, essentially uh, uh, at proving theorems mathematically about uh, such uh, rules in the forking problem. So we could establish that mathematically that there exist stable assignment rules which are tractable. So intuitively, it is possible to come up with algorithms uh, that resolve the forking problem 
in the sense they, they find stable assignments and they do that in an efficient manner so that they, that they can be run uh, effectively. And there is, a diff, uh, there is a complex description of, of these algorithms, but there is also an intuitive one, which I'll give you here. So suppose we have these two branches of the fork, the algorithm we came up with works as follows. So we start by saying everybody should be assigned to A. And then we go and look for uh, enough individuals, say K individuals that have this pro pro uh, property preference, namely they prefer to be on the other side with K um, uh, individuals rather than be in A with everybody. Okay, so they, they have a strong preference uh, to move to B. They, they prefer to move to B with K, so with a fewer number of individuals rather than staying in A with everybody. Well, if we find them, we just move them to B. And we then shrink the number of agents or individuals in A. And we keep on going. So we, then we try to find uh, J individuals that have this preference, so the, these patterns of preference, they prefer to be in B with K plus J individual rather than being staying in A with N minus J individuals. So we find them and we move them. Okay, this pro process will have to terminate at, at, at some point. And uh, the, the outcome that we get at the end is an assignment and that's assignment can be proved to be stable. So that's the sort of, uh, well, that's an algorithmic way to resolve the, uh, uh, the forking problem, at least phrased in the context that I just gave you. So that's a positive result. Uh, however, there is also a negative result, unfortunately. So because we were able to prove that actually there exists no uh, assignment rules that are strategy proof, which means that even though we can solve the forking uh, problems in a stable manner, uh, the algorithm I, I sketched for you in the previous uh, slide actually may be manipulated. Uh, and even worse, in fact, you can show that there is no algorithm that is in general strategy proof. So it's a kind of a hopeless situation. Uh, although there are cases in which uh, one, uh, in which the algorithm does be become strategy proof. And those are cases in which only one stable assignment is possible. Because in general, for every pattern of preferences, there may be several stable assignments. If there is only one, then the algorithm I sketched you, uh, I sketched in the previous slides is actually also strategy proof and it's the only one that actually is uh, of that type. Okay, I have an example here of, uh, of a situation where there is only one stable assignment, but I skip, uh, skip that in the interest of time and I'll move um, to uh, then the conclusions. So, um, what I try to uh, then convey in the paper. In the, in, in the talk is that blockchain actually was born as an attempt to automatize governance solutions concerning essentially the replication of data. And uh, that as of course, uh, arguably, uh, that's a for fundamental uh, technological advantage uh, or advance because uh, it is as such an important uh, way to maintain coordination uh, in large, uh, in large network where think of the digital uh, place where uh, we hardly can have any um, uh, hope to identify clearly who's taking part in a specific digital process. So it's, uh, it's really, it's been a fundamental advan uh, advance in terms of uh, um, automatizing the, the uh, replication of data in situation that cannot rely on trust. Currently, uh, the off-chain governance layer, which of course exists for every uh, blockchain system is mostly informal. So, and arguably in some situation is non-transparent. So there is a push and there is a kind of locus for research uh, that tries to, um, tries to um, incorporate more governance functionalities at an algorithmic level. So the attempt that I sketched in the last part of my talk was uh, essentially an attempt at providing some pathways for a solution for on-chain governance, in particular in the case of uh, deciding about hard forks. And last important uh,
uh, technological advances in, uh, in the recent years, including, for instance, uh, artificial intelligence, really, uh, those are all situations in which you see an, the importance of um, communication between different uh, scientific uh, scientific areas. And I'm a big uh, you know, fan and proponent of interdisciplinary uh, research in, uh, in those contexts. So I conclude here, and uh, uh, if, uh, I'm happy to, of course, take questions and hopefully uh, to give answers. So thank you. Thank you so much, Davide, uh, for this presentation. Very clear also for the implications that it may have for interdisciplinary research, which we are all very much interested. Uh, so I'd like to open the floor for questions and uh, feel free to unmute yourself. It's very quick by a small group, or if you prefer, you can put it in the chat and we'll, uh, um, we'll figure out a way to answer them. Um, I had a question uh, about the slide where, um, well, first of all, thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah, so I had a question about the slide uh, um, about how the Byzantine problem is solved uh, through the um, protocol. Um, yeah, and the lottery part. So my question was about, um, you say that basically you have more winning chances if you have more um, computational power. Uh, but correct. So how do you, um, and this is because I have no idea about uh, computation and, and stuff like that, but how do you gain computational power? How does that work? Yeah, so excellent question. Um, so you can think of this lottery as essentially a, a number guessing game. Okay, so um, uh, if I ask you to guess a number in a certain range, uh, well, essentially the only way you can do it is by trying many numbers, you know? And uh, trying means in this case that the higher your, yeah, the most powerful you use your computer, the faster you can try it. So that's the intuition, right? So I have a bigger computer, I can try more uh, guesses than somebody with a, a less powerful computer. Uh, I mean, I'm simplifying things here, but that's the, that's really, that's the intuition of how this works. And um, uh, that's why then somebody with, uh, uh, with, uh, that has access to more computational resources can essentially try more often and therefore has a higher chance to win the lottery by guessing the number. Um, yeah, to follow up on this, um, let's say, um, so, um, yeah, to relate, if, if it is relatable, but to relate it back to the um, Lego um, figures of the Byzantines, does this mean that basically the general is the person with most computational power? Uh, no, not necessarily. Okay, so in this case, uh, the, the, the question is, so in the in the so the way the general communicate here is essentially by sending messages. Okay, so that's um, that's not so simple in the uh, in the uh, in the solution by uh, so the Nakamoto consensus protocol. Okay, there is a signal or message passing element. Namely, I will. Uh, what happens is that if I uh, if I guess the number. I will, uh, I will be able to send my block to everybody. I'm broadcasting my block and saying, look, this is the block that I made, that I mined, and it's correct because here, here is the proof that I guessed the number. Uh, so uh, what, what, so the, the, the people that will receive it will just typically take it up as, as correct, right? So you just, uh, uh, it just percolates in the network. Now, it can be that I'm malicious, right? And I am trying to send around a, a block uh, with the wrong information. Okay, so, um, and the kind of um, mechanism that is built into that protocol is that uh, under the assumption that a malicious agent does not have more than 50% of this 
computational power. So it doesn't, it has, uh, say, a smaller chance to mine the block than the honest ones. Then you can show that actually, even though malicious agent can manage to build bad chains, their probability of mining a very long bad chain is very low. So they may, they may succeed in doing one block, two blocks, three blocks, but not 20 blocks. So 20, 20 malicious blocks looks like extremely unlikely. And that's also why I, I referred in the slides as, as uh, uh, sometimes why this form of consensus protocol is also called the randomized. So you, you don't have absolute certainty of a correct construction of the chain, but you can, you have probabilistic guarantees that tells you, well, under that, that assumption, uh, malicious agents um, uh, will be very unlikely to, uh, to uh, be able to influence the network in the long run. There's a question from Giuseppe, Giuseppe Dari Mattiacci. Um, hi, David. So I have um, um, a legal question actually uh, um, about the um, strategic proofness of the algorithm. So the, the legal analog of a blockchain would be the, the problem of double sales in, uh, in law, which is, you know, it's as old as the code of Amurabi or other, you know, it's, it's always been there. You have an asset and you sell it to Alessio first, and then I sell it to David the second, and then I leave, and then Alessio and David are left with, uh, you know, discussing who's the owner. And, and so this problem is very old, and um, and the law has taken a different approach. It's not try to um, work out a, a theoretically perfect solution, but rather a practically feasible solution that you know balances the cost of getting things wrong with the benefits of getting them right in a sense. So, uh, for instance, if for, for movable property, personal property like a, a watch or a, you know a bike. Uh, most legal system we use possession as a tiebreaker. So you know, if we don't know who's, who's the owner, the one who's possessing the object, that's going to be the owner. And of course, that's not perfect because you know, a, a thief or a, an unfaithful agent might actually uh, be the one that is possessing the object, or maybe the one who bought it second. You know, this was also honest, as is the one that 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 um, that is possessing the object. And, and with, with respect to um, buildings and land, uh, you know, there is a transcription system, but it, it works in the same way. There is some rule that assigns property to either of the two contents, content, content stands, and, and it's not perfect because, for example, in Italy, uh, or at least the part of Italy where I come from, the rule is that the, the one who registers first is the legitimate owner, but that would be the one who bought second. Right, and the part of Italy where you come from is a different rule because it was under the Austrian Empire. But you know, it's a better rule. But you know, let me take the, my my rule as an example. So th there are two considerations that come from this. One is that the the problem of of art forks usually, uh, and I suppose also in the blockchain, will be a problem of assigning assets between two honest people who have nothing to do with the forking, but simply find themselves somewhat later on two different positions of the fork. So usually, you know, in the law, if you, in the literature about these double sales, the, the lingo is the thief is gone. We cannot deal with the thief, right? The one who caused the problem is gone. And now we have to assign ownership, but these two buyers are both innocent in a sense. And, and so, and then the second consideration is that given that, you know, it's a difficult problem to solve because these people are both innocent, then the law doesn't strive for a perfect solution. So it essentially accepts the risk that property will be given to the, um, to the uh, non-rightful owner, to the one who bought second, for example, to the one who bought from somebody who didn't have title or these kind of things. Um, it just, it just to make sure you know, that the problem is solved, that everybody else now knows who the owner is and that we can go on with life, so to speak. 
right? So th there are two interests. One is one is solving the problem so that you know really we, we want to get the right answer to the question. And two is just get one answer <laughs> as long as we all agree with that. And if it's the wrong one, too bad, there's going to be some costs. But this cost might be actually limited and, and could stay there. So this might suggest that we might want to replace the axiom of strategic proofness with a weaker axiom that says, let's minimize the cost of errors, right? We, which will be, we, which will allow us to leave with some errors as long as these errors are not undermining the whole system, right? The, the, the chain breaks down, but you know, where there's gonna be some temporary problems. Some people will suffer a loss. We accept that. We find ways to compensate them, but at least we can go on with the, with the system. So what, what, I mean, is there a computer science analog to that? Or is there a way to approach this? Or could this be a solution to the problem that you mentioned that there is no strategic proof, uh, uh, strategic proof algorithm? Yeah, so no, thanks, uh, Giuseppe. Uh, I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, you point to a number of interesting issues. I think I would have two comments. So first, I agree that strategy proofness typically is a very demanding uh, constraint or desideratum. So uh, arguably one, I agree with you, one should actually be able to live with the weaker forms of, uh, of uh, say axioms or property for, for if we're really trying to solve, uh, to resolve sort of the, uh, to give a procedure for hard forks that is uh, democratic uh, or fair, um, then perhaps we can live with weaker axiom. And I think that would be an, the natural line to pursue, to find the algorithm that still have a uh, sufficiently, they're sufficiently well-behaved, perhaps not strategy proof in general, but strategy proof under some assumption of the preferences of the participants. So I think that's definitely research-wise a, 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 a good direction to pursue. So I agree with that. And then I have a comment about your your an analog with the law. So I think that's your analogy. So I think that's interesting, but somehow in the the way I think of hard. So you know, if you think of the law, that means you know we have a community, and we have to take uh, one decision, but nobody leaves. So we have to agree. You know, that, that, that that's the decision taken by the law. It's uh, willy or nilly, that will be the decision that everybody has to stick with. While in, in, in hard forks, the interesting aspect there, that also from the point of view of a kind of the social choice perspective that I, that I talked about, is that actually we're talking about communities where uh, essentially, if you're not happy, you can leave. Essentially, you leave and you create your own law. I created my own law according to which I have this new law, legal code, and I'm the owner. And others will join me in this parallel reality. Uh, and I think that's, so that's where the analogy I think breaks. Uh, because here we're really talking about the possibility of essentially creating another, I continue the analogy, another legal code according to which now I'm the owner and somebody will join me. And so the question is, well, for us, it's paradoxical in a society to think about that, but in a digital context of a blockchain system, that's what happens actually. And hard fork is in a sense, changing the rule of the game, maybe because of your personal interest or because of your ideological convictions. I talked about the, for instance, the, the hard fork between Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash. That was interesting also ideologically because there were people that really thought Bitcoin now is just a store of value, and that's not to the spirit of Nakamoto in 2000. It should be a currency. So we have to use a different protocol. And then they split. Uh, so, but I think uh, reasoning with the you know, analogy of law, I think with law, it's, ve it's very interesting. So, so just, I mean, but a, this was just a comment. Yeah. yeah, so just a follow up, because that's super interesting. But, you know, in, in a sense, you can create an alternative to the law, because the law has to be enforced. Yeah. So imagine, you know, the law is unfair and people don't like it, you know, they will step out. So this is what it has been observed, for example, in developing land uh, countries when, you know, the IMF or the World Bank come in, they establish a recording system for land, but that doesn't work. And then people stop recording their land and they transfer land according to other systems. And, and so the actual possession is, is not 
uh, mirrored by the records and the records lose significance. And uh, so in a sense, there is this tension about, uh, so the problem becomes finding a rule that solves the problem that makes most people happy so that those who live are a minority and they cannot live because they are too small, right? I mean, you can think of criminal organizations are enforcing alternative legal systems as people stepping out and not enforcing the law formally, but looking for other ways as people refusing to abide by court orders. So that in a way, we, I think the, 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 the analogy could be carried over True. Uh, and, and the problem will become, you know, minimize the risk that mo most people will leave, which is uh, a sort of different version for, of, of the re removing the axioms or uh, weakening the axiom of uh, the requirement of strategic, uh, strategy proofness in a sense. Um, yeah. No, I agree. So you can definitely think of think of it like so. In a sense, it is a uh, you can think of it as a. I mean, in a sense, what you see in a hard fork as a, could be also interpreted like that: that you have just a, a majority community uh, and you have a well organized minority that disagrees and uh, creates their own system. And uh, well, criminal organization or or a sec secession or in a, you know in a federal system could be thought in that way. Okay, we, uh, we have now uh, Giovanni Sileno, Costantina Marco, Edoardo Martino, and if there is time, I also would like to ask a question. So would you like to take the questions, the three that I mentioned in a row, so because we, we don't have so much time, or you want to answer them one by one? What do you prefer, Davide? Maybe one by one is it's better. Uh, All right, so Giovanni, I'll try please. to be quick. Uh, yes, so that's actually that's in the line of the discussion you were having at this point, because I was making the mapping as well with human communities. So I was considering if a fork is a small community that decides I, I won't stay anymore in this community, I'm creating my own my, uh, one to avoid the conflict, conflict between preferences uh, that uh, occurs into this society. But then if this analogy works, could we think also that we could have an algorithmic integration at a certain point? if for some reason the parties find again into the same kind of preferences. I mean, that's yes. the other point. Of... Yes, that, that's a very good point. Uh, we mentioned that in fact, as a future work, like, so we're talking about uh, here splitting of a community essentially at a high level, um, but you can also think of communities merging and uh, and then uh, uh, then you can kind of reverse the uh, the coin and look at uh, some form of consensus formation or consensus building algorithms and that's again also very extremely interesting uh, line of research uh, we've done some work with the same co-authors by the way uh, on uh, well in a different setting looking more at digital democracy and uh, how to support uh, say consensus formation in online deliberation uh, so we're Thinking, yeah, I think it, the reverse uh, perspective is very interesting. And it, again, has a, a number of uh, arguably uh, applications. Uh, I, th I thought I mentioned digital democracy, but I can, you know, I could think of many others. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, I think I'm next. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Um, it's interesting because I'm a lawyer economist and now doing a minor in data science. So I'm really happy to see that you say interdisciplinarity actually helps because it feels very messy sometimes. Um, so my question is about how do forks or rather the possibility of forks, uh, how does that affect the actual applications of blockchain and say, um, uh, using it as using Bitcoin as a digital currency, or even more kind of absurd, uh, not absurd, but uh, far fetched at the moment, uh, blockchain voting. I, I heard that idea somewhere from a speaker in a TED or something, and it seems very ab abstract and impossible right now. Or he was referring to machine learning um, voting, but but still, it applies. How how do forks? How can they affect uh, this kind of development? Yeah, so it's a good question. My, my feeling is that uh, it, uh, precisely because there is somewhat a lack of governance or a lack of transparent governance of these systems, uh, their application in, in uh, a societal, societally vital context, like uh, really uh, transactional currency or even voting records, uh, well, that makes it uh, very 
very uh, problematic, right? On the other hand, if we had uh, if we had means to uh, superimpose kind of better behaved forms of governance or transparent, uh, possibly partly algorithmically supported, uh, then then those systems may become more relevant because they they would be also more robust or more trans, trustworthy, say also for or a more more general societal uh, needs. So. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you that this, the fact that this system can kind of uh, any time <laughs> branch off, and uh, um, yeah, it, it's a, in a sense an, an undesirable feature. Yeah, uh, but on the other hand, branching is also innovation, right? So that's a way in which uh, you uh, you can argue innovation in the blockchain world happens by a system branching out to other systems and attempting other solutions. So that's also desirable. And then the question is, uh, how can we yeah, regulate or uh, make sure that the, 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 the systems serve a purpose uh, or at least are fit for purpose uh, uh, when you look at the specific societal applications? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Davide. Thank you very much. Uh, super insightful. It, also from a legal perspective, I have to say, uh, I will try to be very brief. The, the first doubt I have, uh, what, if, what is the difference in your analysis if the blockchain is permissionless or if it is permission? Because many financial applications that are kind of the more advanced one in a sense is permission blockchain where only a club of uh, players are admitted and you can use it to clear derivatives, to, to clear payment, uh, payment system. And, uh, is the is the situation and the kind of possibility to uh, to have an on chain uh, governance uh, would would it play different if, if it is not a common but a but a club and close to this uh, what is the position of coders and developers uh, because and here I, I make a kind of analogy with the corporation uh, the corporation the personalizes uh, the the identity of the of the manager or of the owner and what the corporation does. Similarly, uh, if especially if you take off the kind of off-chain uh, governance and you include an algorithmic governance, uh, algorithms are not magic, right? Is there some, I know nothing about uh, computer science, but uh, there's somebody writing the algorithm and setting the rules of the algorithm. And if you kind of uh, stretch uh, this depersonalization, uh, what are the risks and what are the uh, kind of rules, legal or probably again algorithmic rules uh, to cope with this stretch in the personalization? Yeah, so uh, for the so for the first point, uh, permissionless versus permission. So yeah, I, um, it, it's it's good that you bring this um, <clears throat> distinction up because effectively what I talked about uh, were all about permissionless systems. So that's the the standard kind of uh, blockchain system. Now, arguably permissioned blockchains are technically less interesting because in fact, we, I mean, there, there was a lot, uh, you know, it was already a lot, a lot known about how to run permission systems before Bitcoin. So um, th there is nothing, um, so if, if you talk to a distributed system person, they will say, well, permissioned blockchains is nothing but uh, pre-Bitcoin distributed system where you have control on the access control and you know how to run a system with that has that property. So uh, application, so blockchain in permissioned uh, environment uh, is say um, technically and scientifically not challenging. Okay, but it is the safe option, right? Because, uh, well, obviously a bank doesn't want to throw out their ledgers to, you know, to in, the, in the open. Uh, so, what you see, on the other hand, is in a lot of research, it's a kind of a, uh, an attempt at bridging permission and permissionless system where you have some level of control in, it's taking place or some form of trust structures emerging. Uh, and, uh, and there are cryptocurrencies like Stellar or Ripple that, that try to um, kind of exploit that, that gray area between permissionless and permission. So if you talk about, uh, you know, on-chain governance in a permissioned 
setting? Well, uh, the question, uh, I mean, you can, of course, ask that question. And uh, one, uh, and the, the same said, my, the framework that a sketch would apply there too, right? You would just have um, uh, a full control on the participants or the miners of the network or the kind of the nodes in the network. And, uh, but you can, you can imagine that even in a permission setting, somebody would like to fork out and form a different, uh, a different chain with a sub community uh, going there. So from the point of view of hard forks, I think the difference permission and permissionless is perhaps less, less relevant, but uh, I, will, I would have to think about that. <laughs> That's my first uh, gut feeling. So your second question was about uh, the, the, the person. So who's actually involved in these systems? Uh, like who, who are the actors in the governance? Is that what, uh, did I understand correctly? And what are their duties? Because a, a manager is shielded to us only to a certain extent from the decision it, he takes or she takes uh, running a corporation. What is the position and what should be if you want to go normative? The position of these coders and developers. Yeah, so I mean, you, you see, like in the in the in that slide that I had about uh, this chat log from 2013, like you see, they are the people that take decision are developers, and uh, big mining pools. So big actors in the blockchain, uh, in the Bitcoin blockchain. So the 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 the, the people with the computational power. And this is typically what uh, these are the actors. So, but this is of of course very fluid. There is no and uh, you know uh, this just uh, informal uh, structure of governance. Now, if you know, if uh, if we're thinking of, uh, for instance, sovereign currencies, so suppose that the um, European Central Bank was to set up a, a, a blockchain for. Uh, uh, for a uh, cryptocurrency backed by the bank. Of course, there you would think about, you have to think carefully about what kind of, of um, uh, governance structure to impose at the top of, uh, of, of the chain. And, and at, at that point, it will not just be decided by developers and miners. So I think depending on the application, especially if it's something of an, with an institutional uh, impact, like a you know, currency or uh, uh, like a, a voting record, then you will, you will have to use real uh, kind of real institutional governance on the top of these systems. Thank you, uh, Davide. Uh, in a sense, with your last two sentences, you presented my question. I will, I will. This we 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 we. Uh, the discussion was very exciting. We're out of time, so uh, I will skip this one. And would like to thank you and all the people attending, and specifically, specific mention for our first ACLE intern. Uh, this, the some of the most ambitious students, the master law in finance, will also been attending here and asking questions. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the exciting discussion. Thank you. And uh, I would suggest that we now log out and give it but pass the baton to Davide for the one on one uh, meetings. And see all of you to, at the next ACLE seminar in about a month. Davide. Are you already host, right? Am I? Yes. I hope so. I just want to be sure that you...